volunteers or someone will get voluntold. <laughs> All righty then. Dear <laughs> Heavenly Father. Good old Renee. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. I should just let you tell people. Um, thank you so much for bringing us together today. And Holy Spirit, I just ask that you surround us all and that you um, bring us in with your spirit of wisdom and let us just see these scriptures today in a new way, in fresh eyes, and that um, we each walk away with a golden nugget to open up during our week for growth and a uh, closer bond with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you say amen? Yeah. Snapchat. That's yeah. what I want to know. <laughs> yeah, what about Snapchat? <laughs> Was that Holy Spirit? <laughs> uh, I heard that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, my brother, when he, my brother, when he was little, he used to end his prayers. Uh, Thank you, Jesus. Baseball bats and amen. Like, I don't know. Maybe that was the Holy yeah. Spirit just being like Snapchat and amen. <laughs> I don't know. Because uh, <laughs> my brother thought we were just like listing things we liked in prayer. Like, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for this food. Baseball bats and amen. <laughs> like, it was really cute. I like it. Anyways, it was adorable. Um, okay, so sorry. We are in what chapter five of hebrews um technically actually we're starting at the end of chapter four because whoever made these chapters failed horribly and put the beginning of chapter five at the end of chapter four and it's like all one continuation of a thought so we're, we're having to, yeah so we're starting in chapter four um verse 14 and going through chapter five so what we do usually we just take turns reading just kind of popcorn Whoever wants to read as much as you want, we read through it once and then we just go kind of verse by verse and I have some questions prepared. So if anyone wants to start, that would be fantabulous. What translation are you reading in? We all read from the translation. So like I have the NIV, Skylar usually has the ESV, Renee reads from the little children's version. Um, <laughs> it's great, so honestly. Thank you. <laughs> Janet, what do you have? I got the passion. Um, the good news translation. Yeah, I actually really like it that we all have different versions because it brings a different twist and flavor to what we're reading and it makes it kind of more well-rounded. Um, and April has the KJV, so perfect. It doesn't matter what version you read from. This is the moral of the story. Okay. Someone go ahead and kick us off. I can start. Um, Jesus, the great high priest, let us then hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we have a great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God, Jesus, the son of God. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weaknesses. On the contrary, we have a high priest who is tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. Let us have confidence then and approach God's throne where there is grace. There will be, there we will receive mercy and find grace to help us just when we need it. Do you want me to go on or? Someone can pick up. I think we're at verse one now, chapter five. Probably pick up. Mm -hmm. So it says, for, for every high priest was chosen from among the people and appointed to represent them before God by presenting their gifts to God and offering sacrifices on their behalf. Since the high priest is also one who is clothed in weakness, he humbles himself by showing compassion to those who are ignorant of God's ways and strength. And for this reason, he has not only presented the sin offerings of others, but also to bring a sin offering for himself. And no one takes this honor upon himself by being self-appointed. But God is the one who calls each one, just as Aaron was called. 
So also Christ was not self-appointed and did not glorify himself by becoming a high priest. But God called and glorified him. For the Father said to him, You are my favorite son. Today I end in another scripture. He says about this new priestly order, You are a priest like Melchizedek, a king to you. During Christ's days on earth, he pleaded with God, praying with passion and with tearful agony that God would spare him from death. And because of his perfect devotion, his prayer was answered and he was delivered. But even though he was a wonderful son, he learned to listen and obey all his offerings. And after being proven perfect in this way, he has shown, oh, oh, he has now become the source of eternal salvation to all those who listen to him and obey. For God God has designated him as the king priest who is over the priestly order of Melchizedek. And we're actually going to stop there because the next bit actually is part of chapter six. <laughs> so, <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> also, awesome. welcome, Ryan. Hey, Ryan. Hey, What's up, Ryan? guys? Hello, Ryan. How are you all? Dude, it's so yeah. great to see you. you. Yeah, it's great to see you guys, too. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been. Glad you could join us today. We're in... We are in um, Hebrews That's chapter good. five right now. So, okay, good deal. Just so you know what we're reading. The, the topic um, of Hebrews chapter five is about Jesus as our high priest or as our representative. Um, and we've just been going through the book of Hebrews. And just to kind of give like a background for people that have kind of just joined today, um, Hebrews, the whole point of Hebrews is to set the foundation, um, establishing Jesus as our savior and our Messiah. Because... I mean, it, that's kind of like obvious to us now today because we kind of grew up with that fact. But like back then it was like a life shattering, like new, it was like earth shaking. It was like the newest thing. Like they didn't have, Jesus had just come. And so we don't know who the author of Hebrews was, but um, there's some evidence to think that it was Paul who wrote Hebrews, but he's writing it to kind of prove from Old Testament scriptures that Jesus is our Messiah that he was fully God and fully man and like all the implications of that. Um, and so we've talked about lots of different things. Like chapter one talked about um, how, how God her, how Jesus is uh, the son of God, how he's higher than Moses, higher than the angels and all these things, which wasn't common knowledge for the Jews. This was like a new concept for them. So this is kind of like just laying the foundation because what would be the point of preaching Jesus without like first accepting that Jesus is someone that we should follow, you know? So like, that the, everything had to start from scratch so that's what the book of hebrews is about um anyways so that's kind of where we're at we just finished reading through um one time and so now what we're going to do is just go kind of verse by verse um not every verse but the ones that are significant and kind of just discuss some of the questions um so let's start again with verse 15 of chapter 4 which says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So my first question is, why was it important that Jesus be tempted in every way, just like we were? Um, I think it goes to show you. Can you speak up a little bit? He can only say, I've been, like, can say I, I, I know where you've been. I've been exactly where you are, and you can get through this. Hmm. I like that ending there, April. It makes him trustworthy, doesn't it? Like, isn't it kind of hard to trust someone that's it's also been through what you've been through? Yeah, I was just going to say, it, it makes him relate, like, that he's relatable. If he has been tempted as we have, it just, it, it just puts it, it just makes him relatable. Yeah. I was so, going to put him on the same plane as, but that's not really what I think. So, so Janet says relatable. April says that it's an encouragement so that we you know we can get through it as well. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. And, and just knowing that like so many times nowadays, you know, you want to talk to your friend, but you're like, you don't even know what I'm going through. You've never been there. You don't, yeah. 
you haven't experienced what I'm experiencing right now. So it's hard for me to communicate that to you, but God's been through it. God's done it. He's been faced with it. So it's easier to come to him and say, look, this is what's going on. And him being like, yep, I know exactly where you're at. Yeah. That's really good. April. Like it's, it's really hard for me. I feel like to talk to people that I don't feel understand me, you know, it's like, okay, you're giving me all this advice or whatever, but like, you don't actually understand because you've never been there. And Jesus is like, I was actually tempted in every single way that you were. So like, and that makes them trustworthy. Um, it's hard to trust someone that doesn't, that doesn't understand you or that we can't relate to. Well, I like the next verse too, that says, let us then feel very sure that we can come ahead, before Renee. God's throne. I can do what I want. There's no rules. There's the so many rules. is flowing. How dare you break the, the spirit room. is flowing. I let him out of the box. Are you even Christian? <laughs> Rude. <laughs> no, actually, I'm not. Neither was Jesus. Zing. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> can I finish? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the next verse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> says let us then feel very sure that we can come before god's throne where there is grace there we can receive mercy and grace to help us when we need it so i mean not only did uh is it that he can relate to us but that because he's been through it all he has this uh, um, amazing amount of grace for us because he knows that this world is most days feels like a cat of crap that we're swimming through and um also how can we receive the mercy and grace from him if we're like well jesus you don't really understand me you're just humoring me right now kind of like we do with our friends well thank you for stealing my thunder and moving ahead renee <sighs> rude i did it again <laughs> she did that already He's not wrong <laughs> my bible says let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace mm -hmm. so we don't have to be intimidated by it we just come before him and say look this is what i'm going through right now this is what i need and him say yep here's the grace that's sufficient for that you know come boldly that's encouraging that i don't have to be scared i don't have to be like ah should I talk to him about it right now or just bring it up late now I can come to him and say look this is what I'm facing right now this is what I'm going through do you know what's funny too is we're often like a little skittish to talk to him about it while he's busy doing what preparing the banquet for us do you guys just want to go ahead just and just over and leave bible study because you know <laughs> Look, Go ahead, Grace. Take it away. Look, look, God, I was God, just bouncing off her. <laughs> God has been uh, speaking to me about a church, so I'm just practicing. <laughs> um, no, clearly, God only talks to me as the Bible study leader. Obviously, <laughs> I'll just drink my wine and eat my crackers then. <laughs> oh, I love you guys. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, I guess we're going on to the next verse now. So <clears throat> verse 16. Um, can you just read it again, Renee? Go ahead. What's your thought? No. Then let us, or let us then feel very sure we can come boldly before God's throne where there is grace. There we can receive mercy and grace to help us when we need it. Yes, Skylar, go ahead. Uh, well, I think that <clears throat> I shall permit you to speak. Thank you. Much obliged. Um, I think it goes a lot way further than just, <clears throat> um, you know, we can talk to him and he understands. I mean, yes, that's true. Like there, there is that personal relational aspect of it, but this speaks to like the significance of which covenant we're in right? Because the fact that he was faced everything that we faced and yet was without sin points us back to when he said that he's come to fulfill the law, right? Because the law was, was made between the old covenant was between God and man. So a man 
had to fulfill it, had to satisfy the righteous requirement of the law, as Paul describes it. So the, the requirement of the law has been satisfied. And it's because he lived without sin and we are in him that we know that we are not held to that standard of having to prove our righteousness through our own behavior in order to gain something from God. He has already done that for us. Jesus has done it for us. So when I read this verse, it's not just Jesus understands what I'm going and I can talk to him, although that's definitely true, but it's Jesus has blazed this trail of holiness and righteousness that I am joined with him and get to walk that path with him because he finished it. Well, and that is good. Well, and it says too that like we can receive mercy and grace to help us when we need it. So it goes back to the fact that we rest and just receive it. He's done everything else. And this whole passage is about our weakness and that he's fulfilled it. So it really, this whole passage sums up um, when we are weak, he is strong. He's already done it. We just receive. Wait, so you're saying- And that's the end of Bible study. That we should (laughs) rest? Just just clarifying any confusion we may have. That's definitely- Back to the couch. No, no, I thought we had to really strive and work for our salvation and forgiveness. We do have to strive for his rest. Just saying. You guys should probably all go and make Jesus a sandwich he didn't order. (laughs) I'm sorry, guys. These are like all like things from last week (laughs) that we said. Like the story of Martha and Mary, like Mary sitting at Jesus' feet and Martha's off in the kitchen like preparing and uh, we said like she was off making sandwiches for Jesus that Jesus never ordered. So, <laughs> anyways, yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah. In in that verse, in verse sixteen, where it says we can boldly, we can therefore boldly approach his, God's throne. What do they mean by approach His throne? Like, what does that mean? hang out i like to go chill with papa all the time just crawl up there have a good chat the throne doesn't sound like happy as a we, we can actually pray we can actually pray now instead of like having a priest pray for us yeah. i think it means like we can come and go well back in um, however long ago they used to have kings and, and rulers, and whenever any of the people needed something from the king, they would approach the throne. They'd come into the throne room. They would make their case known to the king, and the king would do something about it one way or the other, whether it was a punishment or granting them something, but in order to receive that, they had to come before the throne. So I feel like that is in reference, like coming before him, making your case known to God and letting him do something about it one way or another. And that's a really good point. Well, and didn't the king have to, sorry, uh, didn't the king have to summon you as well? Because if you go back to the story of Esther, Dang it, Renee! Renee, brave enough to stole it again. What? I was gonna say that. (laughs) Well, you can finish it then. No, go for it. (laughs) You already took it. I was just gonna say. I was gonna say that um, Esther took her life in her hands by going before the king. You know, with the big beating heart, like, oh my goodness, like if he doesn't um you know throw out a scepter to me it's off with my head sort of thing whereas with god we don't have to have that fear yes thank you for that renee (laughs) so like yeah there was no confidence in approaching the throne of a king 
because you're like, oh man, like he might reject me. Like he might not give me what I need or he might kill me for approaching him without permission or without being summoned. But they're saying here, like, okay, we have confidence in approaching God's throne or another way of saying just coming into God's presence, right? Like approaching his throne just means like coming into his presence. Um, and so let's think about in the past, how did the Jews have to, what did they have to do in order to approach God's presence? Go through the high priest. Okay, yes, go through the high priest. What else? Sacrifice. Sacrifices, yeah. Um, let's actually, can someone flip to Leviticus 16? We're going to read something. Keep your spot in Hebrews and flip to Leviticus 16. Sixteen and what? Um, two through four. So this is. So I have about, the King James version. That's fine. This what it's, what we're about to read is um, about some of the the requirements that someone had to do before, like becoming being able to come into God's presence, like back in the back in the time of the sanctuary and the Jews. Go for it. So it says, and the Lord said unto Moses, speak unto Aaron, thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on a holy linen coat and he shall have linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with linen girdle and with the linen mitre. I don't know. M-I-T-R-E. Mm, mine doesn't say that. Anyway, shall he be attired? <laughs> These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. So I appreciate and that you read that. Take of the congregation of the children. Oh, sorry. I thought you were done. It's just to four. Then now. Got it. Um, I actually appreciate that you read that in the King James because it made it sound even more complicated, which is what I was going for. Um, to make it to prove the point that it was very complicated back then. But if someone wants to Renee, if maybe you could read it in the children's version so that we can actually understand what it says, because I actually want to like highlight some things. <laughs> Okie dokie. Give us that hooked on phonics version. All right, children, <laughs> listen up. <laughs> the Lord said to him, tell your brother Aaron that there are times when he cannot go behind the curtain into the most holy place where the ark is. If he goes in when I appear in a cloud over the lid of the ark, he will die. This is how Aaron may enter the most holy place. Before he enters, he must offer a bull for a sin offering and a male sheep for a whole burnt offering. He must put on the holy linen inner robe with the linen underclothes next to his body. His belt will be the cloth belt and he will wear the linen turban. These are holy clothes, so he must bathe his body in water before he puts them on. So yeah, he had to do a bunch of stuff is basically the point in order to come into God's presence. Like had to wash this, do that, clean this, iron that. And like, it, and like in the very first sentence, it says, tell Aaron that he's not free to come whenever he chooses into God's presence. Um, because if he does, he'll die. <laughs> and I was like, okay. That well, doesn't there, huh? There was another, te there was another teaching, uh, that our pastor's wife shared one night. Um, uh, and I thought this was really interesting. It kind of loops into this is that she was saying how when they came out of the most holy of holies, they also had to strip their clothes and essentially put on their street clothes. But she was saying, because if they didn't like the presence of God on their clothes alone would kill everybody. Mm. So if you think about like, now we get to go into his presence freely come and go and it doesn't kill anybody. <laughs> yeah so like back then there wasn't 
yeah, back then there wasn't much confidence in approaching God's presence, right? It's just like, oh, well, you can only come at certain times if you do this, this, and this, and you can't come as you want. Like it's only at specific times. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with this idea or not, but like they used to tie like a rope around the high priest's foot so that if he were to go inside the most holy place and for whatever reason, if he hadn't like actually cleansed his heart or purified himself well enough or done, done the correct consecrations, like he might die in the presence and they can't go in there to go get the body because then they would die too. So they just pull him out with the rope by the ankle. So like, yeah, the whole point is like, there's not much confidence in like approaching back then. So like when he says this to the Hebrews, like we read that we're like, okay, yeah, 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 whatever. But like for them, it's like, what do you mean we can boldly approach God's throne with confidence? Like, what are you talking about? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm trying to highlight the fact that this is like, not just, oh yeah, we can talk to Jesus whenever. Like that was not a thing. Like that was not a thing. This is like brand new. You know what I'm saying? There's more reverence back there too, because they had to do it specifically. And if they didn't, it was their life. There was more like, all right, this is a serious thing. And I feel like now, not everybody, but a lot of times we just kind of are flippant about how we come to God. We're just like, oh, well, he'll be there when I get to him. And it's, we should still have that, that God fearing spirit about us, like respecting who he is and coming to him with that honor and that respect and not just treat it so flippant and he is the king of kings the lord of lords like he is the alpha the omega like he is so like he deserves the highest praise and the highest honor so yes we are supposed to come to him boldly and we have that freedom to come to him whenever now but to do it we should do it with honor and with a humble spirit and come before his throne in that manner rather than just like oh well he's going to be there anyway so I guess I'll get to it when I get to it or just coming at him however um, just having that honor still is it important as well yeah, I think that that's why it's so important to behold him because the more that we spend in that secret place with him, beholding him, that fear and honor and respect just naturally grows in us because you always come out of there in complete awe and wonder of who he is. So let's look here real quick at, at verse the end of verse 14 in chapter four, where it says, and Jesus was tempted in every way, yet he did not sin. And then the beginning of 15, which says, let us therefore approach God's throne with grace and confidence. Um, I'm God's throne of grace with confidence. So it's like, okay, because Jesus did not sin, therefore let us approach God's throne. What is the connection between Jesus not having sinned with us being able to approach God's throne with confidence? He is the perfect sacrifice. He was the perfect sacrifice. Okay. Any deeper? That's why he's pure and like, that's why we can go into him pure and blameless because he was pure and blameless. He fulfilled that as Skylar says. Skylar in the chat says, because he has fulfilled the law because it is finished. Uh, yeah, so like I was saying before, like the, the human high priests that would go into the most holy place of God's presence, like didn't really have a lot of confidence because they're human beings like with sin, right? So like if they don't, um, if they have any remnant of sin in them still as they go into the presence, like sin can't exist in the presence of God. It wasn't so much that God was like killing them, but like the sin within them in God's presence would just it would cause them to die like because evil can't exist like in in the presence of such goodness and so like that's why they had to do all these cleansing things in order to allow them to be able to approach god's presence right and if they did it wrong or if like the high priest was evil i don't know if you guys remember like in the time of like samuel there was like a couple evil high priests and like they were really wicked of heart and like so like people if they were to go into god's presence like this the evilness within them would strike them down and so like because jesus was perfect and because he had no sin 
Um, and because he was perfect, like he was able to go in with, with full confidence that he, like, that he was going to be a, an acceptable sacrifice, right? He was able to go and pave the way knowing that he was the one that was going to be accepted. And because we have been united with him in union, like we have been crucified with Christ and now we are resurrected with him. We're literally like one with Jesus. We have confidence as well because Jesus was accepted. Therefore we are accepted because we are one with him. And so we don't have to be afraid of like entering into God's presence that we aren't going to be accepted, that we'll be rejected and all those things. And that's like stinking cool. Also, how are we going to be perfect by somebody who is imperfect? So we want to be made perfect and, and, you know, we strive for perfection through Christ, but how are we going to become perfect by somebody who isn't perfect themselves? So we have to go to somebody higher than that, who is perfect, and God is the only perfect one. So in order for us to be perfect, we need to go through the only one who is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so this is kind of a, I mean, an obvious question, but like with all of that kind of as the foundation, how are we able to approach God's presence now? Boldly? <laughs> it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So we're thankful, we're happy, we're joyful, yeah. and boldly. <laughs> Thank you, Renee, for always making it so simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like what April said, though, is just... Uh, with that thanksgiving that we don't have to break our backs we don't have to constantly strive we don't you know it's just that beautiful relationship of just receiving from our heavenly father and all the love that he has for us without tiptoeing around on eggshells it's very beautiful skylar put in the chat read ephesians 1 5 through 6 i'm going to read it real quick um ephesians 1 5 through 6 says where is it Oh, okay. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So that's cool. Um, yeah, I feel like so many Christians, um, like mainstream Christianity, um, teaches that like God is up there, right? And we're down here and we're lowly sinners, right? And like, you know, it creates this, like, I'm bad, God is up there, and like, we're so far away from him mentality, where we're like groveling at his feet. He's like, oh God, I'm unworthy to approach you. And it's like, it defeats the purpose of what Jesus came for. It's like, no, like God doesn't want that, want that for us. That's never what he wanted. So he made a way for us to come into his presence freely, like sons and daughters, not afraid of like being struck down by a king or a dictator, right? And so like when we have that mentality of like, oh, I'm just a lowly sinner, we like negate what Jesus did and like what his purpose was to come. And it's like, it's almost like uh, discrediting what he's accomplished because we don't, we don't acknowledge it. And we are only through like, the end of chapter four we haven't even hit verse five chapter five yet <laughs> and we've had all this discussion <laughs> uh all right anybody have anything I else like, to say uh, sky just said in the chat sky just said in the chat that the king james version specifically says accepted that was the point of the king james version in that context by which he made us accepted in the beloved so sorry i read it in my incorrect version um so does anyone want to read the first verse of chapter five i'll read it for every high priest was chosen from among the people and appointed to represent them before God by presenting their gifts to God and offering sacrifices on their behalf. Could 
Could you read that one more time a little bit louder? Sorry. Okay. For every high priest was chosen from among the people and appointed to represent them before God by presenting their gifts to God and offering sacrifices on their behalf. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry. Um, okay. So here it's talking about Jesus being our representative, which is the main point of this chapter. What, what is the role and purpose of a representative? They're kind of the go-between that speaks on your behalf. Is it the go-between that speaks on your behalf? Yep. Think like politics, if that helps. That's, that's also good too. And just sometimes helpful to think of it like in human terms. Like, isn't it just like the person who can represent you and can't be there essentially? I'm having a hard time hearing you. Can you speak a little louder? Oh, the microphone's probably off. I was just saying, um, like, just like in politics, when, say, for instance, like the prime minister can't be somewhere, he usually sends a representative to just, like speak in form of place. Yeah, that's good. Anybody else have any thoughts about about um, what a representative does or the, the rep? The rep, yeah. The 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 rep always takes the blame. <laughs> True. Okay. What else? This is good stuff. We have somebody that will fight for us. He represents who we are. Welcome, Joe, by the way. Everybody. We're Joe. reading, we're reading uh, Hebrews chapter 5, and we are in verse 1. <laughs> <laughs> one hour later. <laughs> one hour later, we are on verse 1. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're talking about what's the purpose and role of a representative. Um, we said some good stuff. They so go far. smooth things over. Huh? They go and like sweet talk people, smooth things over. Yeah. I think of it kind of like a lawyer. Like they know the case. They're there to represent what your, your plea is. They're going to fight for you. When you hire a lawyer, they're supposed to work on your behalf. So. Yeah. It's someone yeah, who's like, like a lawyer qualified <laughs> than you are to do something for you that you can't do for yourself. Right. So like if you're hiring a lawyer, you better hope that the lawyer is better at lawyering than you are. Right. Like otherwise, why are you hiring them? Like. <laughs> You know, they're hopefully more qualified than you are. Otherwise, what do you need them for? You could just represent yourself. Like the only reason you need a representative is if they're, they can do whatever it is better than you. Otherwise just do it on your own, right? I also think of like politics as well. Um, you know, we, I hate to talk about elections right now, but like, <laughs> you know, we don't, presidents don't win by the, the popular vote right you submit the votes and then the electoral college you know votes for you and they're supposed to represent you and and vote like the way that their state voted right so like a representative is supposed to vote and advocate and intercede on your behalf for you and and in your interest right um so with that in mind all of those things that we've mentioned um what did you you love what even better renee Uh, cause I said, Joe said to rename the book of Hebrews to they brew. And I said, no, it's homebrew. And then I put coffee and then April said, uh, even better is what did you say? April Hebrews just means whoever he is, he needs to bring me some coffee. So I said, I love that even better. Um, I think the political correct <laughs> is she brews. Remember it's a man and a woman. No, because then that goes back to she has to be pregnant and barefoot don't in the kitchen making started. coffee. Put it, Grace. Don't even give me. Started. Don't even. <laughs> we're not I'm bringing this up. I'm sorry, everyone, but that violates our community guidelines. Oh my God. <laughs> we have to have. Here comes the small print again. 
they need to split Hebrews in half and have the first part be Hebrews, the second part be Shebrews. That's so what we're gender inclusive. Okay. We're just going to go to the people ideas and they'll actually do it. Let's not and say <laughs> we did. To be politically correct, we have to go back to Joe's sayings then to they brew. Right. They he brew. Said, a they to that. A they. You can't say amen. It's a they. A them. A them. Um, anyways, we can go off on that, but let's bring it back, pulling it back in. Ooh, okay. Anyways, with all of those things in our heads about what it is to be a representative, um, all that stuff, why was it necessary then for Jesus to be fully man? So that we couldn't be like, well, that's no fair. You had superpowers. <laughs> Good, good, yeah. He lived it. He, you can say he really lived it. He grew up as a kid. He was from a baby, married, wiping his dirty bum to all the way up. You know, he did it. His parents even lost him. <laughs> right. He went through the things. You know, I can only imagine. Mary trying to save him and him going, no, no, no. <laughs> you don't stay. It, you know how when parents like, like lose woman, a kid. One day I'm going to forgive you. You know how parents like when they lose a child, like they're like, they're like, okay, God, like, okay, we got to pray like that we can find him. But they're going to be like, dear God, I lost you. Help me find you. Like, <laughs> how do you even pray that? It's like, dear God, I'm sorry. I lost God. Can you help me find Don't, we... Don't we pray that all the time? <laughs> God, where are you? Yo, deep preach. It's amazing. Um, anyways, uh, yeah. Okay. So Renee, you hit it on the, you hit the nail on the head pretty much like with the first thing you said was that if Jesus came just fully as God, then like, it wouldn't be fair, right? Because he wouldn't accurately like be representative of us, right? Like people could say like, oh, well, well, Jesus had an advantage because he's God, right? Like he had powers that we don't have. He has this, he has that. And like Satan actually would have a a legitimate dispute saying that's not fair for jesus to represent humanity and pay the price on their behalf because he doesn't actually represent them he's not one of them he can't pay the price and then so like like there would be a legitimate claim for him to be like no you can't do that because you're not actually a man does that make sense because like this whole thing we're living out right now is like a cosmic uh courtroom in a sense of like jesus versus satan in a sense like who's right whose way is best and like the whole universe is like waiting for the verdict and if like if jesus wasn't actually a man as our representative then he would he would have disqualified himself as being our representative i know i just said a lot of words did that make sense i see like bobbleheads yeah he also knew what it was going to take to get us that perfect sacrifice so he had to live it out in order to become the perfect sacrifice it's like so that we don't have to jump through the hoops that they used to have to well it's it's like every politician is aspiring to jesus did like every politician wants to say i am one of you i've lived your life i'm a, a person of the people I, I'm, I'm listening to Obama's autobiography right now, and, and that's the thing that everybody's trying to do um, is show uh, how, like, Sarah Palin was so popular because she was one of the people. Um, but that's what Jesus did. So you get that from him. Let's um, do you guys remember um, back when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness? Yes, no. Yeah, I remember it. Yeah. Just like it was yesterday. <laughs> You're good. 
Steven, I like how that's the first comment you've made. What did what did Steven say? He said, yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> um so what was what was uh what was satan trying to get jesus to do like what was he tempting him for for his own good okay what were the three he things just trying to catch What were the three things? Jump. Jump. That's one. And food and money. Eat the food. Eat the food, jump off the cliff, and bow. Yeah. He's trying to get him to skip the, the suffering in the humanity and just take, show his divinity without suffering with humanity okay yes so he was trying to get jesus to in a sense forego the human experience and draw upon his own power to deliver himself like hey you're hungry turn these stones to bread right so he was trying to get jesus to use his own power instead of relying on his union with the father and listening to the spirit and following and you know only doing what he hears the father saying and therefore by, you know, foregoing the human experience and by acting out of his own power, it would nullify his ability to represent us because then he would be acting out of his divine nature rather than out of his human nature and would no longer be able to represent us as fully man because he was operating out of his divine nature instead. And so that was like what Satan was trying to get Jesus to do. I like the way you said that, Joe. Does that make sense? Like, it's so, it's so easy to look at surface level and be like, well, why was Satan, like, what was the problem? Like, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing morally wrong with turning a stone into a bread and eating it. Like, how is that bad? You know what I mean? Like, on a surface level, you look at that and be like, I don't get it. Like, why is that a problem? Or like, why was it bad for Adam and Eve to eat a fruit? And it makes people think like, oh, well, God's really mean because like, he makes up these arbitrary weird stuff and like, cursed all of humanity because they ate an apple you know it's like it's not about the apple it's not about the turning stones to bread like it's deeper right it's like he was trying to get him to re to to draw on his divine power rather than on his humanity so that he would nullify him as being able to be our representative before the, before god and like jesus was able to recognize that and like see like really conservative religious mindsets they just look at the behavior, right? And they'd be like, oh, well, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But they don't look at like the, the underlying stuff beneath it, right? It's not about adhering to a bunch of random rules and regulations, right? It's about a relationship and a heart with the father. And Jesus knew that. He's like, I only do what I see the father doing. He said that. And so like Jesus, God, the father was not calling him to perform that miracle of turning stones to bread. So he's like, I therefore will not do it, right? because that's what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to do the same things Jesus did and draw from the same union that's available to us and, you know, be able to live out of the same spirit. And so Jesus didn't want to discredit himself in that way. Did I lose everyone? Or are you guys still with me? Beautiful. No, that was a really strong point. Reminds me uh, of a verse later. in, uh, Philippians, <clears throat> Philippians two, uh, basically five through eight, where Paul says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So like, think the way Jesus thinks, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death even death on a cross yeah so that's a really good point tyler i appreciate um the fact that skylar brought you in today so that you could share with us anytime this is tyler toon um first cousin once removed from skylar boone um 
<laughs> sorry, I <laughs> had to. Um, okay, so that's kind of a really hard like concept. And it took me like, I wrestled with this a lot. Like the idea of like that Jesus did not actually have an advantage over us. And then that's so hard because we think, okay, fully God, fully man. How is that possible? Like, how can you say he doesn't have an advantage? Well, like just what, G what Skylar said, like was like, he purposely did not try to grasp from his divinity. Like he, he gave it up and subjected himself to the human experience. Right. It's, it's like, you know, like when little kids are like wrestling with their parents and like, obviously the parents can win, but like they lower themselves to their level and like, you know, play on the kid's level. And so the kids, like they let the kids beat them or whatever. It'd be like, if Jesus knew that he has a divine nature, it's like he tied his divine nature arm behind his back so that he would be on the same level as like the rest of humanity. Does that make sense? Like, he could have accessed it, but he, if in doing so, like he would have disqualified himself. And that like blows my mind because that like takes so much freaking like restraint and control, like to know that, Hey, I'm freaking starving and I could fix this right now, but I'm not going to just because I can, doesn't mean I should, you know, like that's just, that's <laughs> amazing. Grace, have you seen Black Panther? Yes. Okay, so the, it actually reminds me of, of the tradition to become king in Wakanda. You have to actually give up your superpowers your, and you fight and you actually earn the right through a, a fair fight. Mm. Um, so that's kind of reminds me of that. That's awesome. I don't remember that. I have to, it's been a while. Since kind of forever. Yeah, I think I've only seen it one time. Um, I love like seeing like parallels to the gospel, like in movies. I just love it. I try to find them as much as possible. Um, okay, so my next question is, so what is the problem then with, with people who look at Jesus's life and say, yeah, well, that was Jesus. Well, it totally removes you from as he is, so are you. You're just a little worm, a little victim. Boo-hoo, go eat worms some more. She has a thing with eating worms, not really sure. It's because I didn't get to as a kid, just the gummy ones. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Anybody? Tyler, do you have anything to say? Sure. So uh, before I ramble, what was the question again? What's the problem? Sorry about my work. What's the problem with like the mindset of when you look at Jesus's life and have the attitude of, okay, yeah, well, that was Jesus. Well, the problem is that it's unbiblical, first of all. Um, like, you're not going to find that anywhere in the Bible. In fact, you find a whole bunch of things that are completely at odds with that. Like Jesus saying, he who believes in me will do the works that I do. Telling his disciples to go and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, right? Like, like Renee said, as he is, so are we. Paul telling us, be imitators of God as beloved children. I mean, there's just, he's the firstborn among many brothers, you know? There's like so many things that tell us that we're supposed to actually be like him, you know, that we are like him, that we are in him and he is in us. And like that, that, that notion that, well, that was Jesus. It's, it's a symptom of the same false humility that is a cancer in Christianity. It's the same false humility that causes people to see themselves as less than God has made us to be. It's the same false humility that causes us to focus on our sin and all of the things that we've done wrong instead of seeing the finished work of the cross and how God has actually freed us of that, regardless of how we feel about it in the moment. So like this is the, the problem with it. <laughs> the problem with it is that it neglects the entire power of the gospel of Christ unifying himself to us, killing us, and then raising us anew. 
because it puts Jesus in some category over here and us in some lesser category over here. And we're just these terrible sinners that cool, you're saved going to heaven someday and good luck with the rest of your life, which is just not the Bible at all, at all. I'm, I'm a little concerned about your Bible (laughs) transcriptions because (laughs) If you actually read it, it's only for missionaries and special pastors and, you know, the blessed people. So what I'm hearing from you, Tyler, is that it's not really a problem. Uh, That's not at all what I said, actually. But real quick, (laughs) before I come back to that, um, while Johanna's uh, still here, um, I'd like for us to pray for her. Um, she, um, it has some health stuff going on. Johanna, I think you said you had some, uh, some kind of a liver infection or something like that. So what you mentioned, um, yeah, it's the kidney, kidney, <laughs> kidney. no, something down there. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, <Thanks, Grace. laughs> kidney, liver, meh. yeah, yeah, so, yeah whatever. body stuff. Okay. Um, that's how that's how other people feel when I talk about planes. You know, it's like wings, tails, fuselage, whatever. Something involving a plane. Um, so, anyway, I'll, I'm going to pray for Joanna. If you guys would stand in agreement uh, with me, that'd be awesome. Do we have to stand uh, literally? Yes. Yeah. Stand <laughs> at attention, please. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yes, you will hold that position for the duration I'm of the prayer. I'm not in uniform. I'm not in uniform. Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Great, Father, thank not you. the national anthem. <laughs> I it's pledge the allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to Jesus, Jesus obviously. <laughs> <laughs> is, this, right. is this sacrilegious? I don't know. No, it's not. This is called the joy of the Lord. <laughs> Heaven loves this. Um, okay, jo- Joanna wants to go. Let's pray for her. Um, Father, thank you so much for Johanna. Uh, we just celebrate the woman that she is. Thank you for bringing her into our fellowship of believers, giving us the opportunity to get to know her, to be blessed by her. Um, we lift her up to you right now. We thank you that you're with her, that you're for her, and the challenges that she faces um, academically, personally, everything that she's going through, that you have gone ahead. You've made a way for her. Uh, you've made straight paths through the wilderness, um, and that everything that she faces, you're walking with her, loving her, blessing her, keeping her filling her with goodness, leading her into truth. We speak life over her body right now in the name of Jesus. Um, May her kidneys be completely whole in Jesus' name. Jesus' name, complete wholeness. Um, Every bit of pain and infection and just every problem leave her body. When we speak life from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet, may she be restored, filled with strength, filled with vitality, filled with life, everything that she needs to meet the days to come. Thank you for revealing your heart to her, God, showing her who she is in you and who you are in her. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And her stats exam. Thank you so much, Skylar. That was very, very beautiful. It means a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. Bless you, Joanna. Get some rest. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys next week. Have a great rest of the session. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 (laughs) So, yeah, back to your your question, uh, Grace. Yeah, it's totally fine to say that, you know, whatever. Um, Kidding, obviously. The reason that, the reason that people say that, the reason it comes up is when we don't see, when we, when we see space between the life of Jesus and our lives, right? We, we have to deal with that. We have to reconcile that somehow. Like we care, we care about walking with integrity, you know, but we don't understand like, wait, all this miraculous stuff, this power of God transformation is happening in the Bible. And here's me just struggling with all this mundane sins and struggles in life, right? And we don't see how to get from here to there and we don't see it in anybody else's lives around us right nobody's shown us nobody's blazed the trail you know a lot of times 
of course, the truth is people have blazed the trail. There are people living that way. But if you don't know anybody that's living like that, you just feel like, well, I guess that was then and this is now. And, and you start making excuses for why my life doesn't match scripture to make yourself feel better and to rationalize it. Right. But what we have to do instead, instead of watering down the Bible to meet our experience, is we have to call our experience up to the level of the word. Well, it goes into everything that we talk about so often is that we just really don't understand who we are in Christ. Yeah. Yeah, so that was really good, Scott. I mean, Tyler, um, you should you should help your your step cousin Skyler get on your level. He needs some serious help. But um, <laughs> yeah, so there's there's lots of problems with this. And like when I when I when this was revealed to me, it was like my mind was literally blown. And like, it was like a radical like paradigm shift. I was like, wait, so you're saying that Christians are supposed to look like Christ. And I was like, what? <laughs> I thought they just meant like metaphorically, like, but they mean like, no, like it's actually possible. Like, like Jesus came to show an example of what it looks like to be fully man and drawing only from the power of like a relationship with God, like with the father, like, like that's it. That's the only thing that Jesus had to do the things that he did was a relationship with the father. Right. And then like, when we say like, oh, well that was Jesus. And like, you know, he's God or whatever. It just shows that we have a lack of revelation about the gospel and t- sky tie, whoever you are, um, it's made a good point about like false humility so this is something also that changed my life and was um, really like changing for me because like I used to struggle a lot with like um, like self image and like feeling down on myself a lot and and I felt like that was more humble in a way than being like oh yeah I'm the greatest you know like if you put yourself down then it's like you have more humility, you know, but in actuality, like if God is saying one thing about you, like he's saying, like, I have made you pure. I have made you righteous. I have made you worthy. And you're saying, Oh God, I'm unworthy. I'm a sinner. Like I'm unworthy to come before your throne. Woe is me. Like you're actually believing your opinion of yourself and asserting your viewpoint over what God says about you, which is actually pride. Cause you're saying oh, my, my thoughts about me are more true and better than God's thoughts, which is ridiculous. Right. Cause that's not true, but it's like, that's, a, that's false humility in the sense that it's pride. Cause you're choosing to, uh, to elevate your views over God's views. And like, when I realized that I was like, oh my gosh, like what, like everything I know is a lie. Like, you know, it was just like, it was crazy. Um, and the second point of why this is a problem, there's many, many reasons why this is a problem, but the one I'm going for today is that, when people say like, oh, well, obviously Jesus was able to live the way that he did because he's Jesus and he was God, then what they're saying is that Jesus isn't like us. He isn't one of us. And therefore he, they're disqualifying him as being their representative before the father to bring them into his presence. So literally they just like in saying that you, you disqualify Jesus as being your savior. And like, that's like, that's a revelation right there. That's crazy like in, in making that distinction between you and Jesus, you're saying, I'm not, Jesus isn't like me. Therefore he's not my representative. Therefore he can't be my savior. And it's like, whoa, <laughs> that's big. Uh, Grace, you're, what you said about humility is actually right in line with what C.S. Lewis says about humility. And I, I love this. Um, he says, I believe it's in the great divorce um, or, you know, one of his books. And he says, Humility is not a beautiful woman looking in a mirror saying, I'm ugly. That's lying. Um, Humility, I I love this illustration. Humility is looking at a piece of art that I've made and that you've made and being able to equally appreciate them Um, and to say, this is is a wonderful thing. And like, think about, you know, I I get as um, excited about a great video that that Skylar makes as, as one that I make and um yeah uh, but you're gonna have to take my my um trophy for humility away because i just accepted it um but uh i I love i love that that idea that that, you know that's what humility is is being able to appreciate beauty whether it flowed out of you or someone else yeah that's awesome there's a thing that chris valentin he's one of the um 
pastors here at Bethel Church, he says he was he was art not arguing. He was debating with someone who like has this mentality where like we need to position ourselves as lowly sinners before God. And he's like, it's arrogant and prideful to say that, you know, you're righteous and pure, like, you know, you're a lowly sinner. And so he said, okay. Um, and he points to a painting on the wall and he's like, look at that painting. He's like, okay. And he's like, and then he starts like criticizing the painting saying like, this painting is ugly. This is the worst painting I've ever seen. It sucks. And like, and then he said, by me saying that to the painting, did that bring honor to the artist? And he was like, um, no, that's gonna like Aww. make the artist like feel bad and not, you know, like that, that doesn't bring honor to the artist that brings dishonor to the artist. And he's like, in the same <clears throat> way, like God created you, you're his masterpiece by constantly criticizing yourself and others. It's like, you're saying that his, his, his artwork is trash and like, that's not humility. And like, that was really like, awesome to me as well like realizing that like when we constantly put ourselves down we're not putting ourselves down we're putting god down that's awesome i uh yeah i love when chris talks about that i found the quote that joe was talking about i'm going to try to read it um i have to like switch switch to a different screen on my phone i'm going to see if you guys can still hear me can you still hear me right now yep okay cool so this is actually from the screw tape letters um i would have predicted the great divorce as well but um <clears throat> He says, God wants to bring the man to a state of mind in which he could design the best cathedral in the world and know it to be the best and rejoice in the fact without being any more or less or otherwise glad at having done it than he would be if it had been done by another. God wants him in the end to be so free mm. from any bias in his own favor that he can rejoice in his own talents as frankly and gratefully as in his neighbor's talents or in a sunrise, an elephant or a waterfall dude mic drop i just love c.s lewis like he is my man crush monday every day even though it's friday it's fine <laughs> uh anyways so yeah like there's so much to unpack here like we could talk about this forever i made a video with actually some people in this group about just the fact that like the when I finally like it hit me for the first time that Jesus had no advantage over us I went on like an excited rant and like made a video with them um and if anybody's interested in, in seeing that I can send it to you um but anyways um yeah so let's go let's go on to the next the next couple verses here um unless anybody else has anything to say on this topic that we've been saying Speak now, or forever hold your peas. Okay, cool. Um, who wants to read verse five? Verso cinco. So also Christ did not choose himself to have the honor of being a high priest, but God chose him. God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Sweet. So, okay, back tracking a little bit. In the past, like in the Jewish, you know, sanctuary and all that, how were the priests selected? Didn't God choose them? Yeah, I'm like, did, did they go out and fill out a job application or like, you know, how did, how did that process work? <laughs> God appointed them. God said, hey, you, by the way, you're going to be in charge here. Yeah, good. So just highlighting the fact that it wasn't like, hmm, when I grow up, I want to be a high priest. Like, you know, you don't get to like apply for that job. Like you get chosen, right? Um, so my next question is, uh, how was Jesus appointed and selected? Joe said he went to monster.com. <laughs> no, indeed is way better. And DM'd a recruiter on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> what was the question? Uh, how Jesus was chosen by God. Yeah, how was Jesus selected to be high priest? Same way. 
<laughs> Renee, I can't. <laughs> uh okay Surprise. no like I'm, I'm looking for like a specific thing that happened are you talking about the thing on his with john the baptist yes when the bird or... <laughs> the bird thing pigeon whatever <laughs> the, the bird that gave the word oh my gosh oh my. Bird the bird is the word <laughs> It was like, hello, Jesus. Yeah, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, perfect. You're it. <laughs> anyway, yes. At the baptism, Jesus was anointed. The dove descended, symbolizing the Holy Spirit or whatever. And what did the Father say? What did God say? This is my son and well, whom I'm well pleased. Yeah, and so like Jesus was appointed and selected at that specific moment. So before that, though, before he was selected and appointed, what was Jesus doing? Hanging with the bros. He was growing up. He was learning. Yeah, I mean, we don't know, really. Like, there's not much in the Bible about that. Like, Until we don't know. Until he was 12, he was teaching and speaking to the men in the... Yeah. We, so we know Please. a little bit, we know a little bit, we know like that one thing, but like, you know, he was like, what, anointed at 30? Like he was 30, right? When he started his ministry, is that correct? Yeah, something like that. But it's like, okay, did that mean that Jesus didn't have a relationship with God up until that point when he was anointed? No, because hadn't he just come out of the desert when that happened? The baptism? He went into the wilderness after he was appointed. Well, even oh, after. He was saying, like, don't you know that I'm about my father's work? Like, he was he was learning. He was growing into what his role would be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, like, Jesus is, wasn't, like, at, his, at the baptism when the Holy Spirit descended. Like, he was suddenly imbued with, like, power and a relationship with God. Like he had that the whole time, right? And if he wasn't drawing upon his own divine nature to do his miracles, he was, you know, drawing from his relationship with the father. Like he could have, like, he could have started like doing stuff before he, like he waited till he was 30, right? He like literally was waiting to be appointed and selected in the same way that like the high priests had to be chosen, right? He was like, he honored and humbled, he was honoring God and humbling himself to not start what he probably really wanted to start. Like he knew what his purpose was. He knew what he had to come here for. And he's like humbly waiting. Like, like how, you know how hard it is for us to wait sometimes? Like we're like, oh God, like I know you've called me to do this and this and this, but like, um, you know, what's going on? Time's a ticking. Like Jesus could have like taken it upon himself and like started doing stuff, but he waited for God to anoint him and select him right like that's like that's crazy to me but like think about it like okay like back in the day like we know we the levites were the chosen tribe to be to be the high priests right like it was out of the tribe of the levites that the people were chosen um nobody else got to be a high priest but like okay what if some dude named i don't know bob from the tribe of Benjamin was like, hey, you know, I really want to be a high priest and like start serving the Lord. And so he like put on the high priest stuff and like, you know, marched on into the holy place. Like, what do you think would happen? He would die. Dead. He wasn't called. Yeah, swipe, left, rejected. You know, like, no, that, that wouldn't work, right? <laughs> Good old Bob <laughs> <the> Benjamin. <laughs> it's swiping so left, different. right? That's the right direction. Tyler's like, oh, I think it's left. I think, anyways. Um, wrong group. <laughs> wrong group. <laughs> pulls the lever. And you God pulls the lever. Like, Emperor's New Groove. Emperor's New Groove. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my point here is that, like, Jesus, like, if he was functioning from, like, his relationship with God, which he had, obviously, like, he wasn't like all of a sudden given that relationship 
at the baptism. Like he was, he was waiting that whole time, like knowing his purpose, knowing why he's here, like how like frustrating, like would, would that be to us? Like to know like, Hey, I've come to do this great thing. And like, I'm ready right now to start. And it's like, I'm 30 and I haven't even started yet. It's like, God, have you forgotten? Like, why are you, but he like, he waited, like he like, Ugh, I, I just can't like wrap my mind around the fact that like he patiently was like, I'm not going to step out until my father has like told me to like, isn't that crazy? That's amazing. I, and, and I think there's also a powerful lesson here that I've, I'm hundred percent sure I've heard Chris Felton preach on Joe. I know you and I have talked about this, um, <clears throat> you know, and it's like, especially when we're in a place in life where we like, you know, we have these big big visions, big dreams for whatever in the future in our lives. And sometimes we feel like we could just, you know, like hit the fast forward button and just like skip to that part in our lives. Um, but like, it doesn't work that way. Like in the kingdom, you know, like what you have to experience and go through and grow, grow through enables you to steward that thing that you're dreaming of, you know? So it's like, that's why so many people who win the lottery and get these sudden huge financial windfalls end up destitute and they ruin, ruin it all because they don't have the character and the stewardship to actually harness that gift, you know? And so it's like, God wants to take you from, you know, the slums to the palace, right? But he has to build in you the character to steward that gift before he just plops you into the palace. Yeah, like I can't imagine like, you know, if I knew I was the Messiah, right? Like I'm obviously not, but like, if I came to earth and I was like, I know I'm the Messiah. And like, I see all these people around that I know, like I can help them. Like, I'm going to like, they're sick. I want to heal them right now. And then like recognizing, like, you know, God hasn't called me yet. And like being able to have the humility to be like, you know, it's not about me. Like I could help them and like making it all about yourself. Like I'm going to ready to help that person. I'm going to help this person. Oh, go me. But like functioning outside of like God's calling like he humbled himself to that point, like how much restraint and like patience must that have like required. Yeah. And trust. And... Go ahead. I was just going to say, and trust because he had to trust that even though I know right now I can do this, this, and this, like I need to trust that God has the bigger plan. And if I do step out and do this, this, and this, I could actually ruin or, or change the course of that bigger picture or that bigger plan so just trusting that god already has that worked out and i don't have to worry about that and just following you know. Amen. so that brings me to my next question which is what can we learn from the humility and patience of jesus the fact that he waited 30 years for God to call him to begin his ministry when he already knew what his mission and purpose was. Like, what can we learn from that and apply it to our lives? While the audience is thinking about that, <clears throat> I have a quick point I'd like to make, which I think I've, uh, which I think I've shared this with you, Gracie, and maybe Joe, but um, uh, so this is something I heard a, a Christian speaker say once and I was like, whoa, that's big. Like specifically with regard to the miraculous, you know, the, the, the miraculous signs and wonders, healings, miracles, things of that nature, which we know scripturally are available to us um, today. Um, and sometimes we, we can get stuck in a place of like wondering why don't I see this happening? Why is this not manifesting in my life? Why, you know, we have those why kinds of questions. And um, this preacher responded to someone who asked that question and he said that's the wrong question right you shouldn't be asking that question you shouldn't be asking why why isn't everyone that i pray for healed you should be asking for god to build in you the stewardship to be able to handle with integrity a gift of that magnitude because think about it what if all of a sudden every single person that you prayed for was healed like honestly think about it you would have thousands of people lined up outside your door every day. You would have people mobbing you. You'd be an internet celebrity overnight, you know? And that kind of, I mean, we see leaders and preachers and televangelists and all these people 
falling into grave moral failure, you know, because of the way that pride can corrupt and power can corrupt. And so like, you know, it's not, you don't want a gifting without character. You want the character to be able to steward the gifting first. Did God give you my mail this week or? <laughs> mm. That's good. Does anybody have like a personal, like a personal life application? Like how this might change how they, you know, what they learned from Jesus's humility and waiting? One thought that I always get is my time is not his time. What he thinks should be and when it should be is not according to what I think or what I want. But his ultimate, like his timing is the perfect time. And whenever he makes something happen, it always happens at the perfect time. Because what do we know anyways? <laughs> Right. We only know what he tells us or what he gives us. You know, it's funny. I just realized like our timing usually is always now. <laughs> like, like we're always like my timing is now. <laughs> right. But like maybe now isn't always the best. Like, you know, when I was like 19, I was like, I want to have a boyfriend and get married. And like, that would have been a hot dumpster fire disaster. Like if I got married at 19 years old, like what kind of nonsense, ridiculous, like, ew, like I can't even like, but I, my 19 year old brain, I, I couldn't have like, I couldn't have like realized why that would be a terrible decision. I was just like, well, I want it now. So obviously if I'm not getting it now, then that's not good. You know, like, but like, can, can we all just praise God for a second that I'm not married at 19? Like, just give me a second. Like, Ooh. Ooh, yes. dude, dude i'm 40 and thinking ew <laughs> but but you, you see what i'm saying like our timing is always now right like i've never i've never heard someone saying you know i really want to get married but i don't want to do it for another 20 years like i've never heard anyone say that They're like i want to get married now like you know like you know most people are just like if they want something they don't want to wait for it like you're like i really want to buy a house but i don't want it now i want to i want it when i'm like 50 you know like people like they want what they want now when they want it right? But, like, think about, like, there's, there's, well, we're conditioned in, yeah, like, instant gratification. I was gonna say, we're conditioned in society, yeah. Yeah. McDonald's. This, I mean, this, yeah, this brings up the, I mean, the classic, you know, the classic issues of time, you know, and how, like, we, I think we have a consistently non-kingdom mentality about time. Like on the one hand, we want everything now, but on the other hand, we're so infrequently actually present in the moment and sensitive to what God is doing right now, right here. Our mind is on our list of things that we need to do and on, you know, how I want situations X, Y, and Z in my life to work out. And we're feeling bad about what happened yesterday or a month ago or five years ago, you know, and it, it, and we don't grasp that like, it's, it is about right now, but it's about God's heart for other people right now. Like that's what matters. And, and I love, I was talking to Joe actually earlier back and forth over some audio messages about Paul's heart, you know, where he said to live is Christ and to die is gain, you know, like whether I stay or, or go or when I go, it's all the same to me. Right. Because it's about Jesus regardless. And like the more that we can get that into our brains and not get hung up on the events of our lives and whether this works out or that works out, or I get my big breakthrough in whatever area, man, we'll have so much more peace and so much more freedom. And we'll just live so much more abundantly, regardless of what happens or doesn't happen. That makes me think of uh, Shadar 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where they said, you know, whether God takes us out of this or not, like, we're still going to trust and believe in him. We're still going to, you know, we're not going to do what you want us to do. We're going to do what God wants us to do. And having that faith and that trust, no matter what their outcome was going to be, they didn't know if God was going to, you know, save them from the fire or not. They just trusted him and said, if he saves us and if he doesn't, we're still going to do this because we know what's right. Going more off of what you know rather than what you feel is probably best as well in a lot of situations because what we feel is human. What we know can be from God. Wait, so you're saying we should walk by faith? <gasps> Crazy. <laughs> I think that might be in the Bible somewhere. No, no, I, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm thinking of the verse, therefore, you must walk by feelings. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what it says. And, and yeah. Skylar, I beat you to it. <laughs> he said, I thought it was walk by feelings <laughs> and not by sight. <laughs> Finally, I, be, I stole someone else's thunder for a change. <laughs> But their reward, I mean, their reward is that because they they stood up and said, no, this is what God would want us to do rather than what people would want us to do. They were brought out of the fire and so many were turned to God because the king was like, from this point forward, this is what we're going to go by. Like so many can be brought to God by us if we just say you know what no matter what I feel or think about this situation I'm gonna go by a, like what God wants me to do and people will see that and his timing is perfect timing so when it needs to be seen many people will come to God through that like we can be the example the light the the testimony a living testimony for God anybody else have any other juicy jesus nuggets <laughs> i i have a juicy jesus nugget since you asked so nicely um so on the on this topic of you know you're my son today i've begotten you um just to kind of bring it back to the verse that we were in it made me think of the transfiguration I looked at Matthew 17, um, where Peter, James, and John go up onto the mountain, right? And they, you guys know the story, right? Uh, Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus. Um, and it's interesting to me, the thing that I thought of is, you know, we've been talking here in this Bible study about how Jesus fulfilled the law and how he understands what we've gone through and all of this. And kind of, we've been doing some contrasting between the high priests of old and, and Jesus, the high priest. I find it very interesting that Moses, Elijah, and Jesus appeared, right? And I'll just read it. So um, a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them saying, rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only i think that's very interesting that god is specifically specifically juxtaposing jesus with moses and elijah and saying this mm. this is my son listen to him mm, that's good right there because like they grew up like you know hanging on the words of moses and elijah and like yeah. and putting jesus like on the same playing on uh, the same level as them you know uh i not I had not thought of it that way it's deep that was a very <laughs> juicy jesus nugget <laughs> the juiciest. Pretty juicy. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy we're all that perfect. was no mcdonald's nugget right there <laughs> that was at was least a kfc it was golden. That was at least, at least kids. Maybe Popeyes. Chick-fil-A. Ooh, Chick-fil-A is where it's at. 
All right. All right, let's move on uh, to verse eight here. And uh, who wants to read that one? Verse Ocho. Even though Jesus was the son of God, he learned obedience by what he suffered, which is why Christians must suffer. Is that what yours says? No, I added the last part. I was like, dang, like what in the world are they teaching these children in the children's version? <laughs> I was like, um. <laughs> no, okay, no, even though Jesus was the son of God, he learned obedience by what he suffered. Okay. <laughs> oh boy. Um, okay, well, um, <laughs> what encouragement for us is there in that verse? <laughs> we must suffer. We love it. Uh, no, really. So, what I would do if I had you know, a little bit of time here is do a uh, do a little deep dive into that's the hand gesture for deep dive, by the way, in case you're wondering, um, into the Greek. Um, and I actually, if I remember correctly, I actually did it before about this word suffering. Um, because it has a connotation in English that is not necessarily the same in Greek. We see suffering and we think um, like being hurt, going through really hard stuff, you know, and there is part of that, but it's more of a neutral term in the Greek. It's more of a neutral, like to feel things, to experience things, to, to go through stuff and be acted upon by things, right? So it, it can be kind of positive or negative. Um, and so like, I don't, I don't think this verse is saying, in my opinion, like he learned obedience because he went through really hard stuff. I think it's saying that he learned obedience because he went through things like we talked about. He went through this season in his life of growth, like we are called to, of, of, of the journey from, you know, to use the analogy, you know, that Chris uses from, you know, from the, the, the pauper to the prince, you know, from the streets to the palace. Um, and so we can, we can embrace that same journey of learning obedience, learning to walk by the spirit through the things that we go through. And that's what I, that's what I see in this verse. Renee, I'm trying right. to get to you. Snacks. Um, I actually, that pulls me into something I was watching this week, um, where they were breaking down some words and one of the words was the word obey in hebrew is the word shama which in translation is to be in the fire and transformed by the living waters and frequencies of the father so we can see and i think it fits in perfect right there Say it again. Come on. What? Okay, hold on. <laughs> the word obey is the Hebrew word shama, which means to be in the fire. Okay, which is interesting that we brought up Sh Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. To be in the fire and I think transform. I'm eating fiery hot Cheetos. You're interrupting my lesson. <laughs> How do you like it, huh? It's like we've flipped, re we've reversed roles. <laughs> to be in the fire and transformed by the living waters slash frequencies of our father so we can see. I would snap, but I have Cheeto dust all over me. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, what I saw in this verse is that even Jesus had to grow. You know, like he wasn't born fully complete and, and like done, right? 
otherwise what would be the point of a relationship like if there's if you already like have a relationship that's done or fully cooked so to speak like you have no you can't grow in it anymore like then that's kind of like that's not really a relationship because a relationship involves like continual growth and getting to know each other deeper like I know not a lot of us here are married but like I hear married people all the time saying like you'll always learn something new about your spouse right like you'll never know everything there is to know like you'll like if you want to get your PhD in your spouse, like you're going to be constantly learning. Like it's a never ending degree, you know? And so like seeing that even Jesus had to grow and then realizing that like, we're meant to be the same way. Like we're not meant, we're not, we aren't born like fully cooked in a sense. And like, that's not actually a flaw. Like sometimes we look at ourselves and we're like, oh, I need to grow in so many areas. It's like, yeah. Yeah but like, that's the point. Like, that's what a relationship is, right? Like we, we tend to look at those things and be like, oh, it's such a bad thing. We have so many flaws. Like we need to grow. And it's like, no, like, like that's part of our design was to rely upon and have a relationship with the father so that we have a relationship, like, right. And even Jesus had to grow. So like, I find encouragement in that to realize, like, I'm not supposed to like have everything all perfect already. Does that make sense? Oh, well, that just blows a hole in my whole life. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, and if we go back to, you know, the Hebrew meaning of obedience and, and this word suffered, um, I think it just goes back to kind of w- what we all go through, just like he did, which is that purification of fire, which isn't so much a suffering. It's just um, it's uncomfortable. The growing, you know, when you think about growing spurts, growing pains, it's uncomfortable. It's not really quite the suffering of like running around the world with your cross all day, every day, and your dead body and all that stuff that we like to do. Look at Renee bringing the fire. I'm the one eating the fiery Cheetos, okay? You're eating the fire and I'm just spitting it. Grace, what you said, um, remind me of, uh, think about how close, well, so Janet is a mom, who else, any other parents, um, imagine how close parents become with their kids because they need them, imagine how hard it would be to become close with your mom if you, you popped out and you're like, well, I'm off to uh, Harvard, see you later. <laughs> Yeah. The fact that you're, you know, I see it with my sisters, uh, all, all three of my sisters had young kids and they get close because they need them. And even my little moments with my nieces and nephews, it's like, Uncle Joe, show me how to do this. Oh, thank you for showing. And we both bond over it. So Laughing maybe, in Cheetos, is, fiery hot Cheetos is not recommended. <laughs> so, Grace, you could get a bag of regular Cheetos and a bag of fire Cheetos, mix them in a bowl, then you have half hot Cheetos. No. Jesus said, because you are lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth because you're neither hot <laughs> or <laughs> <laughs> oh, Okay. Um, so this is the last question I have. And it's, what allowed Jesus to grow and mature? I feel like it had a little bit to do with uh, Mary and Joseph knowing from God what his potential was and allowing them to be the parent, but really step back and allow God to direct him. So allowing that connection to happen rather than being the overbearing parent, you know, you know, like they, they taught him and they, helped him grow as a child into a young man into an adult but like they also gave that room for growth from god not i don't know i don't really know how to explain that but yo april um, just that just made me think like you know the term helicopter mom 
-hmm. like someone who just like hovers over their child constantly and like you know like made me realize like like okay how much (laughs) trust would it have taken god like who's perfect right and like doesn't mess up to be like oh here's my son i'm gonna give it to some sinful humans to raise and like chose not to like helicopter mom him you know like god could have like been like nope not trusting the humans to raise the son of god like but like he even let mary and joseph lose him (laughs) like you know that's crazy oh that's crazy okay because god knew where he was all the time right but they also like they god told them who the son was going to be like he didn't just she just didn't magically oh i'm pregnant now like how, what's the explanation for this like no she had an explanation this is going to be the son of god like you're going to be the mother of jesus like this is going to be you know this and i think her and joseph i'm sure it was stressful at times but just trusting that god knew what he was doing and Mm -hmm. just allowing that allowing them to be the parent but also allowing god to be the guide Like, they could have been like, no, you're not going to the temple. Are you kidding me? You're 12 years old. You're not doing that. And then and then what, what would have happened, you know? But no, they're like, okay. Oh, you're going off to teach some people? Oh, okay, yeah, have fun. Come back for dinner. Like, Yeah, could you imagine being Mary and Joseph? Like, oh, hey, by the way, you're going to raise my son. No pressure. Kind of like do, do you like how do you discipline the son of god like do you put him in the corner like you, yeah. you don't you don't spare the rod that's what right you get but it's like you teach him what's right how freaking terrifying is that you're like okay jesus if it's okay like i need to spank you but if it's not okay that's totally okay too you just let me know <laughs> like i don't think it was like that i know but i'm just like a win for my little kid they just I used a paddle. Know. They just used a paddle with holes in it so that it was a holy spanking. Oh, oh snapping! I'm dead. <laughs> I can't. Those are the worst spankings too. Don't do it. I don't recommend it. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything to say about this? Wait, what was my question? <laughs> Wait, hold on. What was the question? Oh, what, yeah. What allowed Jesus to grow up and mature? Besides holy spankings. Right. I would imagine he had to do what we do, you know, um, and live under that continuous flow of grace and mercy. Well, he was designed to grow. Like, all of us are designed to grow. Like, that's our design. So right. that's, that's why we grow. He wasn't different from us. Yeah, I think that's why they he had to see. Like everything grows, like even a plant grows, even like animals grow, like everything grows. But what what is there that doesn't grow? That's just how God does it. That's how God designs stuff. If you're not growing, it's because you're not alive. And if you're not perfect, it's because you didn't get a holy spanking. <laughs> you are canceled. <laughs> <laughs> oh not again <laughs> um no but that's actually well, like- too like um i was actually just reading about the fig tree that god came up to and there was leaves but there was no fruit so god was like there was a few instances where god was like there's no fruit it's there's no growth here cut it down burn it do what you gotta do like get rid of it when there's no growth something's wrong so if god wasn't able to grow because of the environment that he's in then something was wrong so he had to be moved from another environment you know there was a few times when joseph had to obey and move because certain situations were going to happen and that growth could have been interrupted 
people that if that makes sense it's, it's parents and the leaders in Jesus' life that listened in those moments where God was speaking that allowed for growth as well that's what I'm trying to say and I just had this like this thought just now that I didn't plan on saying but like what Stephen was saying, but how like everything grows, like plants, animals, like if you're not growing, that's a sign that you're not alive, right? But what we tend to think is like, oh, the fact that I'm growing proves that like, you know, a couple years ago, I was less righteous and less sanctified than I am now. And I'm less sanctified and righteous than I will be, you know, in several years from now, when I grow into big, better righteousness, it's like, no, like, you're growing because you're alive. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever like met like Christians that are like, oh, well, I struggle with whatever lust. And they're like, but I'm growing. And like years go by and they're still struggling with it and they haven't made any progress. And they're like, oh, well, I'm a work in progress. I'm growing. And like more years go by and they're the same thing. It's like, there's no growth happening. Right. And so it's like, I feel like you're using process as a way to excuse the fact that you're not growing and like what you're talking about the fig tree April it's like we should be growing out of our union with Christ in the same way that like a branch attached to a tree will grow because it's attached to the tree right it's growing because it's united with the tree right if it's not united with the tree like there's separation there's no relationship the branch isn't going to grow it's going to stay exactly the same because it's not connected to the life source right? So uh, the fact that we do grow isn't proof that like we're not, that sanctification is a process, but it's a fact, but it proves that like we are functioning out of union. And the fact that we're growing deeper and deeper and deeper is because like we have unity already. Like we don't reach towards a relationship. We're growing from a relationship, you know? And so like that just was like really cool. Like the fact that you're growing means you're alive, like alive in Christ. Like you see fruits of the spirit and fruits are like agriculture. They grow like they're growing in you because you are alive in God. Ah, oh, that's so good. That's, awesome. that's really essentially how I overcame all my addictions. Uh, and there may have, might've been one, two, maybe 10, but it was just from getting to know Jesus more and more. One or two, where, ten. <laughs> you know, maybe more. Uh, but like, but the more you get to know him and the more you abide in him, the more they just are so unappealing. There's no comparison. It's fool's gold. Amen. That's so yeah. awesome, Renee. Um, yeah. The thing that occurred to me, Gracie, when you were talking about growing, <clears throat> I was reminded of, of something, um, a thought from, I don't know, a year or so ago, where I was thinking about like how we, we're like plants, right? In the sense that we're, we're designed to, to receive nutrients, to take things into us and then to, to, to grow, to prosper, you know, and scripturally we're vessels, right? We were made to carry something. We were made to be a, a host, if you will, right? We are a host of the presence of God, right? He lives in us everywhere that we go. He goes. I am the right? host of the zoom chat. Thank you. That is a helpful comment. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, so we're designed to be filled with things, specifically God, to be united with God and to grow from that place of union with him. But it also applies in the sense of how we go about our daily lives. What are we putting into ourselves, you know? It can be simple physiologically, food and exercise, right? Sleep, um, but also on a more spiritual level, like what are we looking at? What are we listening to? What types of conversations are we having? Who are we talking with and about what? You know, like we've all had that experience where you surround yourself with certain types of people and you start to become like them to, for good or ill. Um, and so I think it's, we were made to grow in Christ, um, but we, it's very important for us to, see that and choose that and choose to water ourselves with truth and with things that bring life um because there's no middle ground like there's no there's no like neutral 
neutral is reverse. <laughs> Joe, I think you've said that, you know, like neutral is just as bad as reverse because, because neutral leads to reverse and neutral doesn't take you into the things of God. Are we you know? talking so about like, cars? We're talking about growing and the, there's some like cross pollination of the analogy between a plant and driving. So growing, well, driving. I, I, I'm a woman, you know, I don't understand cars and driving because I'm just a woman. Okay, now. here's one. You have to mansplain this to me. Here, here's one that works. Isn't there saying something along the line of if you just sit on the road, you'll get run over? Sure. Yeah. Well, the, the, the analogy that Skylar's talking about is um, I picture life as, as sort of like an uphill climb a little bit. Without God's help, without the power of, of God, then your default is going to be reverse. Um, because you're going to fall, roll down. You need power to get up the hill. Yeah. So you're saying if we have Jesus, then we have gas. <laughs> <laughs> or you can go with the Christian, the Christian, the church view is even a horse needs a real good spur. Giddy up. Well, maybe those Jesus nuggets give you the gas. <laughs> I mean, he did He did say that we're supposed to feed on his flesh. Can I say? Dude, yeah. let me tell you, these mixed with coffee, not a good combination. Because coffee can why, give you... What is why wrong you with ever you? decided to do that is beyond me. No, 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 I don't mean like mixed in coffee, but like you have some coffee and then you eat some fiery hot cheetos. Yeah, why you would, why on earth would you do that? I thought it was a good idea at the time. Okay, they both yeah, felt famous, delicious. Famous last word. <laughs> um, maybe before, maybe before uh, we leave, we should pray for Gracie. Yeah. Yeah. Give me a new digestive tract, please. <laughs> yeah. Let me just say, it's just as fiery going in as it is coming out. <laughs> oh, no. oh, wow. Just put your toilet paper in the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweet relief. <laughs> what are we talking about? Holy gas? What is it? Gross. <laughs> growth that's right yes jesus please grow me and you know next time not to do that that's growth you're learning i'm proud of you <laughs> uh, you're that's welcome i've given you officially too much information it's just wrong i'm gonna need prayer <laughs> Let me just say, let me just say, I thought I was dying. I Googled it and realized that several people went to the emergency room thinking that they were hemorrhaging, you know, out the other end and that the doctors all laughed at them because they realized it was just fiery hot Cheetos. And so I saved myself <laughs> by not going to the emergency room for that. Wow. Jesus, help us all. <laughs> Janet. You kids are about ready for a timeout. I gotta tell you. Here comes here comes the holy spanking. Yeah. yeah. You all need a nap. I would love a nap. Maybe I need a nap. Oh man. Don't you guys just love my authenticity and vulnerability to share things these things with you? Doesn't it just enrich you your life? Is that what this is? <laughs> you all are so authentic. It's it's amazing. I mean, <laughs> totally really, <true>. truly. <laughs> uh, well, now you can't say you haven't been warned. <laughs> I I just love Janet that you come back all the time with love and acceptance, even though some days we're a little loony. Oh, uh, listen. <laughs> Listen, I raised three of them and they have taken me places I never thought I would go, be, say, do. 
<laughs> just just like flaming Cheeto butt? <laughs> um, let's see. I had my kids tell me that um, their nose farted one time in church. Nice. <laughs> my, my son looked at... <laughs> Jesus on the crucifix, and I, I just could have died this day. He was sitting there, real quiet, good little, cute little boy, and he says in his quiet little voice, who shot that guy? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, just eat me up now. <laughs> Honestly, I, I just... I, I, I just had to keep looking straight ahead because <laughs> I just. <laughs> oh, oh, what do you mean? We have a crucifix in the house. How did you? How come this is the first one you noticed? <laughs> You're expecting boys <laughs> to notice things. That was your first mistake, Janet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Whew. I don't want to laugh too hard. I just ate a half a bag of hot, fairy hot Cheetos. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're done with the questions. <laughs> Never survived the death nut challenge, Grace. The what? The death nut challenge. The death nut challenge. Yeah, I just did that the other night. That was, whew. I don't know what that is. I don't is. know why I did it. You just look it up. Death nut challenge. Mm. Yep. It's rough. It's a rough can of beans. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to pass. Uh, I thought I was going to pass. I literally had to go outside and lay on the concrete because I was like, why did I do this? No one appreciated my joke just then. I'm just shaking my head at you. No one liked it? <laughs> that was good. I was like, I'm going to have to pass. Some gas. Okay, Gracie. Uh, being tried by fire god didn't mean flaming cheetos <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh uh should, should we wrap this up real quick for the recording sake and then you know <laughs> keep talking they, they live for this whole they, they live for the ending oh uh, any any other anything related to jesus and stuff or are we done <laughs> I'm just really thankful for him. And I'm thankful because of him, we have us. Mm. Amen. Yeah. Um, Amen. <clears throat> for the background of this Bible study today, just knowing that when we come to him boldly, he's going to answer in his time. And trusting that process. Amen. Uh, I would like to read read a quick um, little blurb from the book that I've been reading. Request denied. Um, uh, your denial is denied. Um, <laughs> <You're> <laughs> we want to we want to hear a little ditty. Okay, so this is from the only, book. Cause... Only if you can wrap the, wrap it. That's not going to happen. Um, I can <laughs> I would... sing it. I will not wrap it. <laughs> Rapping is singing with anger uh, ew can you do that deep throat singing <laughs> so anyway um this is from the book cosmos reborn um by john crowder so he's talking about the trinity <clears throat> he says question problem or answer oriented problem uh, in a wrong um <laughs> in addition the trinitarian approach is not causal or problem oriented it does not start with problems like why do some not believe instead it begins with the identity of jesus christ and his work which was sufficient it is answer oriented our rationalistic greek culture is obsessed with figuring out everything logically why do some not believe how am I going to explain logically something as illogical as the sin of unbelief? You cannot explain evil. It is not logical. 
God never gives us an explanation of evil. He only gives us the answer to it. All we have before us is the mystery. If there were no bottomless pit of evil, then Christ's cross was pointless. He would not have come to be the atoning sacrifice for sins. No, he doesn't explain evil. He just deals with it. He deals decisively and completely with darkness by entering that dark, hopeless void that separated us from him and bridged the gap in his own life, death, and resurrection. He doesn't say, why no faith? He says, here's the answer. He doesn't say, why are you sick? He says, here's the answer. He doesn't say, why are you poor? He says, here's the answer. Having spent years in healing ministry, I've seen the whole machine become obsessed with looking for roots and causes to the problems of sickness, rather than resting in the simple reality that by his stripes, we are already healed. The gospel is always the antidote. Let's start with the answer, not the problem. It is the higher reality to which we continually appeal, even when circumstances fly seemingly opposite. Yeah, that's good. Uh, God's been doing and downloading some stuff with me this week. And one of the things he said was, um, like with movies, there's always that duality of good and evil, right? Which is that tree playing out. He said, but in the end, there's always a happy ending. And it's like, why is that? Because all good and evil uh is for the greater good like it all ends up in a happy ending where it's like jesus wins <gasps> sorry renee i'm not laughing at you i'm laughing no at no i know comment. you're laughing at the <laughs> comment i'm sorry i'm laughing that skylar's laughing <laughs> i'm trying to imagine what a causal would be you know is it like i you know honestly what i'm envisioning gracie this is a causal it's like it's like a thermos, right? That you put your drink in, but it's in the form of a stuffed animal. So it's fuzzy and you can carry it around and pet it, but also drink out of it. That's a causal. I think, I think you should get the patent for that immediately. <laughs> so for those that can't read the chat because it doesn't show up in the video, I, when he went, then the first sentence Skylar said, you said something about, what was the first sentence you said? Uh, um, it, it was. Hurry up faster. There we go. Faster. Oh, sorry. I'm getting there. Hold on. Quicker. Um, You're fired. I'm almost there. Almost there. Almost there. Problem. Okay. The Trinitarian approach is not causal. C A U S A L. Causal. <laughs> so I, he said that. And in my mind, I'm like, what's a causal? And I'm picturing C O Z Z L E. And I'm like, that's not a word, Skylar. Learn to read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh my so, gosh so a causal is now a fuzzy thermos that you carry with you and pet and also drink out of i'm picturing it as a unicorn and then the nozzle can be the horn <laughs> <laughs> i'm picturing it as a verb actually when you causal someone it's like coddling them but you're also like touching them with like fuzzy mittens so you're like, causing oh. them there's definitely a fuzzy connotation to it, for sure. Yeah. We're both picking up on that. <laughs> and maybe the maybe the Z Z L E is like dazzle, so there's some like sparkles in there too. I'll give you that. I'm sorry, yeah, we could do some sparkles. Renee, did you just say Z Z? Yes, because that is the way you are supposed to say it. I'm sorry, but it's a Z Z. Z Z Top is a group. That's that top. <laughs> they actually say that in Flight of the Concords, they say ZZ top. Yeah. That's hilarious. So we do not want to causal the gospel by coddling it and fuzzying it down. You know, we want to like embrace the full power of it. We don't want the we don't want a causaling Christianity, is what I'm getting. Because then we don't get random sparkles, we get the full fire. By the way, Skylar, the thing you read is actually in line with um, modern psychology. There's a growing movement toward solution-based counseling where you don't need to spend eight weeks unpacking what happened you know, to your pet turtle when you were four years old, but simply like, here's where you are and here's where you're going. 
Um, and it's really, really helpful and, and can be a lot more helpful, but it's, it's great, you know, thousands of years later, psychology is catching up to, um, to the gospel. Um, awesome. And what is, and what is the solution? Oh, sit with your feelings. That's it. <laughs> There's a lot more to it. There's a, a great book called uh, Solution um, Based Pastoral Counseling that I read during my degree that's um, very in line with what Skylar read. It's awesome, man. Appreciate you sharing that. Thank you, Joe, for getting us back on track and away from the causal. Um, but yeah, no, that's all the questions I had prepared for y'all today. Can someone quickly just pray so I can stop the recording so this doesn't have to go on? <laughs> Poor for I nominate April. Okay, so if there's background noise, I'm sorry. But... Dear God, I just want to we do want to come before you and thank you for everything that you've given us, the words of wisdom, the little pieces of nuggets that you've given us today during this Bible study. Lord, I ask that you help us to grow in you, in our faith, in our patience. Lord, let our our mindset match yours. Let your mind be our mind. Your heart be our heart. God, help us to be unified and continue to grow in spirit and in truth. And thank you, Lord, for everything that you're doing and what you're going to do. We speak faith and prosperity in your name, we pray. Amen. Amen and a woman. No. Stop. Amen. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just so funny. I can't. <laughs> it just gets Hold funnier on. each time. Oh. Do they have to include like children too? Because it's not fair just to include adults. What about like a child? <laughs> You're also leaving out the non binaries too. So, yeah, That's like a they. A, a they. Yeah, a they. Sexist. How dare they say and a woman? That's just excluding all the other ones. Said it. I mean, he has no idea what he's talking about, and it makes me want to choke slam him. <laughs> Everyone look out for April. <laughs> April can and, be oh, the, the godly smackdown on his life. <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> <laughs>